Good evening from Korea. My name is Professor Jennifer Bates and I am the Assistant Professor for Archaeological Science at the Department of Archaeology and Art History at Seoul National University. I work with macrobotanical and microbotanical remains, predominantly phytoliths. My work is in India for the most part. I look at material from the Indus civilization through to Ganeshwa Jodhpura cultural material. And at the moment, I'm working on Southern Indian Neolithic and Iron Age material, as well as two projects that I'm running. One of them is exploring the ash mounds of the Southern Indian Neolithic. And my latest project is called Indica, and it's about to start thinking about the Mesolithic of the Ganges region and how rice domestication developed in this area. What I wanted to do was to talk a little bit about open access publishing and some of the challenges that could occur with this in order to spark discussion. It's not so much to pose solutions, but more to suggest some areas that are positive and also some areas that might be more difficult and therefore that we might need to discuss during the workshop. So some of the things we talk about with open access publishing are relating to the different options we have when we publish. Things like green open access, where we embargo an article for a couple of years, through to gold open access, where we pay to publish, essentially, and it is then open for the reader, and they don't have to pay to look at it. And there are various different options within these. This is a very much a simplified version, and that's something we can go into in the workshop, the different details within this, and the different options that you might want to choose. What I'm more interested in isn't so much the, the nuances of that, but the different requirements that are put on us in terms of funding bodies and also university requirements in relation to what options you are required to make. For example, some of the European funding, ERC, requires that we go for gold open access options, sometimes some of the higher levels of gold open access, some of the lower levels. Green open access, can be an option, but it, it's less so. Other times, universities might require us to go for the gold open access or the green open access. But in other cases, it's not really seen as a problem. It's something that doesn't really matter. It's not factored in, and instead it's just publish. And this is this discrepancy between different choices made by different funding bodies, different universities, creates some I would say inequities and also difficulties. For example, if you're an early career researcher, you might not have the same access to gold open access funding that somebody in a higher level might have. Equally, you might have smaller quantities of funding to do that big gold open access that you are required to by your university. Within this as well, you have different people in different parts of the world that have different access to funding bodies that are willing to support whether or not you can do gold open access. And again, that's back to the requirements of those funding bodies. But then that becomes an issue of who's able to read different articles and who is reading your articles. So if you're in a part of the world or have access to funding that doesn't require or doesn't provide funding for gold open access, you might be ranked lower in the readerships because people can't actually physically look at your articles. There's also the will of the universities. I've worked in places where universities really don't value gold open access publishing. They just think it's okay that you published somewhere. And it's more to do with whether it's an international journal, whether it's a highly ranked international journal. And that, of course, then becomes an issue because the higher ranked big international journals are sometimes pay for play. And I'm not just talking about things that we're all thinking about, like MDPIs or Frontiers. Nature, science, antiquity, for example, are all places where it's essentially becoming pay to play, pay to publish. And if your university or your funding body isn't really valuing the idea of publishing gold open access, they're not going to support you in doing this, at least not more than once, let's say. There are ways around this that we can talk about, I think, in the workshop. For example, 
checking the requirements on you to fund, talking to the journals is another thing. For example, the Journal of Open Archaeological Data has waivers. And that, again, is really helpful in many respects, talking to them and saying, look, I really do need to publish open access, but I'm unable to because my funding body or my university is not supporting me, or I'm not able to because I'm a junior researcher. But it also affects us again because different places will say, sorry, it's not up to us to support you. It's up to your university or your funding body to help you. So we can't always assume that gold open access is automatic or that it's going to be always the right way to do things because of these inequities in the system that is supporting us publishing. Other things that might be affecting us are things like regional differences, whether you are publishing in international journals or national journals. Do national journals, for example, support gold open access? Do they even have it as a category? And this then affects how data is disseminated beyond, say, a national border or even beyond its own readership, its circulation. That then again affects who's able to access the data and so on. Other things we might want to think about and talk about is what about our permits? Our permits for excavation, for example, or for handling materials might require us to publish in something that is not gold open access according to a funding body. Are you working with a national or even regional system that requires publishing this article and making it available in a print format? How does this then affect us? Things we could talk about perhaps are how we go about discussing, for example, with an editor, maybe making it available in a repository or maybe making it available, for example, through the data, pushing the data in open access use issues of copyright and reproducibility of data in two places, the permit data, the permit version that goes in the national journals that are print only, for example, or limited circulation, and also those big international journals that are gold open access and meet our funding or university requirements. How do we handle this? How do we talk to the editors about these problems? And on the flip side, we've got people working in areas that are not served by some funding systems that might not even be able to access open access papers because they can't download the PDFs. They're still working in places where it's the print circulation that the journals, sorry, the libraries are purchasing and bringing in, and they're not able even to pay for that circulation and access those systems. Open access doesn't always mean open access. So my message really is that we need to be publishing open access, but it's not as just as simple as hitting the gold open access button and paying for it. There are funding discrepancies at different hiring positions, at different universities, at different funding bodies. This has ramifications for who's able to be published, who's able to read it. And this is on a global scale, a national scale and a regional scale. And so it raises a question, at least to my mind, and I'm happy to debate this and discuss this, about whether gold open access really is always the right thing to be doing and what we can do to make it the right thing in an equitable fashion, how we can work around this system that isn't equally available to think about things like working with print journals and online circulation, working with journals to improve the junior research access or the regions where funding is not quite so amenable to doing this, to make it so that people can do open access in the way that, say, an ERC funding might approve, but also to think about doing it in a way that doesn't break copyright law and also then is able to be accessed by people that maybe can't download things or that need to read it in print form. So essentially, I would like to argue that we need to be debating and discussing what exactly we're putting in these different formats. And also, as a final thought, has gold open access created different grades of papers as a side effect of creating a gold open access pay to play system? Are we reserving by accident or by intent some things for the gold papers, some things for the green papers where we don't pay, but they will become gold after a two year embargo? and some things for the non-open access print or regional circulation. 
And what impact is this grading that we might be subconsciously doing having on actual access to different groups within and beyond academia? Are we being selective in our data management, our interpretive management, and what impact will it have? Those are my thoughts.